But uh, chances are, if you do, then you've heard me talk about DC39. That's pretty much the only thing I've been talking about since the last two years or so. It's, uh, it's kind of sad, but I mean, that's where we are. Uh, but this is sort of a more official thing. So I'm gonna, uh, so yeah, I, I guess like what I was gonna say is if you know me, which I, I suppose a number of you are, surprisingly, uh, you know, you've heard about DC39, yes? Uh, by the way, is the stream on? Is this working? Yeah, it's on. Okay, perfect, sorry. Uh, just obsessed with myself. Uh, so, you, you've heard the word DC39, right? Like, you've heard it pass around you, yesterday, something. How many of you feel that you understand to some extent what it is and what it does? And, okay, you, and that's it. Okay, so so this is gonna be a wild ride. But, uh, yeah, it, it, I mean, it doesn't make sense, right? It, it doesn't explain anything. So So this is it, this is, where I would explain what it is, and it's something that I've been doing sort of over some time. So let's be honest, like this is nothing new. This is, what I'm gonna to present today is is not gonna be unique in any way. You can probably find it on the internet, uh, but that's sort of the goal in a way, right? Like that we, we're trying to explain to as many people as we can in every way we can how it works and how Surprise, you can be involved. So let, let's make it slightly more interesting. And so I would try to use the same content, more or less, to, to say more or less the same words, speak the same message, but sort of tune it for you. So if at any point you, you want to sort of slightly change the way I, uh, I explain something, let me know. And, and I'll do my best to sort of modify as we go to explain things to you. But yeah, let's start. Uh, too much talk. Obviously, first things first, about myself, I am a Jewel. Uh, I work at Egalia. Uh, more on that later, but I work on compilers. I have been a delegate to DC39, uh, now sort of co-chairing the group. Uh, also an editor of one of the specifications, again, a big, Mumbo jumbo, a lot, lot of words that don't mean stuff, numbers, but I'll explain. Uh, sort of working on different projects, and here, not not quite international, I guess anymore. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I, I'm back, so. But but a little bit about Egalia before I, I get into the meat. Uh, it's a software consult. Uh, okay, software consultancy, uh, sort of based around Galicia in Spain, but. Uh, you know, kind of everywhere. We we have people working out of uh, pretty much any country you could think of. Uh, we work exclusively on free software, uh, so that sort of connects into the whole FOSS thing. Uh, thank you about that. Uh, and a lot of our work, especially in the browser space, because in case you didn't know, like a majority of the work that goes on on browsers, on sort of web standards, it's all free. Free software in the sense, like not uh, free as in free beer, free as in free speech. So a lot of this happens in these committees, these bodies of standardizing things. So there's DC39 that I'm going to talk about. There's also W3C. I think many of you might have heard about W3C, probably more than you have about DC39. So they do a lot of web stuff. What WG does, a lot of web stuff. There's Unicode and DC39. So that's sort of kind of the areas we work on. Obviously, like uh, a lot of our work goes on into web browsers, as I said. I work specifically on compilers, more specifically on compilers inside browsers. So that means your JavaScript engines, uh, your uh, WebAssembly engines, uh, you, you heard about some of them yesterday, and web standards, which is what we're gonna talk about today. This does not work, okay, fun. None of the pictures work. Uh, fun. Maybe. Okay, give me a second. Four or four. Why? These are pictures that should be embedded, and yet they are not. Fun. JavaScript is fun. Uh, huh. They are there. It could be 
about the Wi-Fi, but uh, I'm going to try it again. It's okay. Why did I write my presentation like this? I hate myself. Okay. It's not working, so none of the photos are going to work. That's cute. Uh, we're going to work with that. So uh, what I say here at this point is that we work on something called, well, what you all know as JavaScript, but that is not the real name of the programming language we write, if you knew, like a little bit of trivia, we call it ECMAScript, and, and where does this ECMA come from? Like, what is ECMA, right? Well, ECMA TC39, that's where it's from, but, okay, <laughs> anyway, uh, ECMA, or European Computers Manufacturers Association, it's, it's uh, quite a mouthful, is an organization of, well, computer manufacturers, or not quite, not anymore, right? It started long ago with like IBM and a bunch of computer manufacturers coming together. Fun fact, to, to work on CDs, because CDs were like kind of the first standard that like computer manufacturers across the board wanted to work with everything. So it was like sort of the, the first moment people started thinking about, hey, what are things that should work across vendors, across countries, across and CDs, well, that's, that's where we started. And now we have something much bigger than CDs, the web. The web works everywhere, from your toasters to phones, whatever, like every device runs the web. It is a platform that spans basically all the world and, and it works more or less consistently. I mean, yeah, some things might fail in one browser or another, but more or less you expect the same thing to work across all technologies, all hardware, and that is quite something. Now, how is this achieved? How is this level of standardization achieved? Like across different people, different organizations, different products. That is kind of the work that we are talking about. So it is a technical committee of ECMA. That's where the TC and TC39 comes from. Well, it's a 39th technical committee. So that's pretty much all the name sets. But what does it do? So it is responsible for creating the ECMAScript, or JavaScript, as you might know it, language and its standard API. So you might or might not make the distinction, but there's two parts right, of the language. There's the syntax, which is the, the sort of how you lay down your code, and semantics, like how does, thing react, how does everything react to each other. So it's like, yeah, if I, Call dot proto on this object. This object should do something behind the scenes, and, and that sort of semantics uh, are standardized across the board, so that nothing weird happens on on any specific uh, environment. This work is is sort of spanned across three documents. So that that's where the ECMA proto two came from. There's ECMA two six two which has the core JavaScript language and the core standard API. So things like map, set, all the basics that you expect from the language. Then there is ECMA 402, which I was talking about. This includes specifically the internationalization part of the standard library. So uh, uh, how many, quick show of hands, how many of you have used any of the internationalization features of JavaScript? Not many of you, but thank you. Uh, date time format, formatting the date and time according to any locale, any calendar, number formatting. All these things are, are very important for any programming language, but if you are invested in a programming language that is primarily, let me be honest, like, yeah, okay, you write node code, but let's be fair. JavaScript is primarily used to build user interfaces. That's very shines. That's how it's sort of designed. And for a programming language that sort of specifically excels at that, or for better or for worse, is used mostly for that, uh, internationalization is a vital part. So it's not enough to include a bunch of uh, data in your website to sort of pass back and forth with your uh, users. You need to include internationalization features in the browser, in the programming language. Make it easier. So that's ECMA 402. I, I like to toot my own horn. That's uh, maybe it's it's a more biased reading of how important it is. And JSON, like well, who could have guessed? JSON is a very 
important format. It is, it, it, at this point, I would say that it's not even limited to JavaScript in any way. Like, uh, I mean, people write web applications or not even web applications, APIs or anything really with JSON as, as the data interchange format across the board. It's, it grew out of JavaScript, but it is its own thing now. And so we also maintain the standard for that, which surprisingly, well, not surprisingly, doesn't update, mostly. Well, maybe we'll add comments, but no. Uh, and then this committee has different subgroups, uh, subcommittees, if you will, that are responsible for different things. So there's DG2 for internationalization. It's a task group too. So that's sort of where we do all this internationalization stuff. Then there's TG3 for security. Uh, this is, uh, I just realized, it's slightly outdated, these presentation, but now we have TG4. Uh, and can anybody guess what it's supposed to do or what it's working on? What is the new frontier for JavaScript? Source maps. So we're working on source maps. Source maps are not a part of the programming language, but it's an essential part of the developer experience, right? When, you, when your code breaks, you need whatever is running, like the uh, uh, the debugger, like the browser, whatever. If the code is minified or, or whatever, you don't care. You need to be able to find out where problems are coming from. And so source maps, very important for the actual developer experience. Not so much for actually just running the code, which is what we have focused on so far. So expanding sort of our horizons. Uh, so you're starting to sort of form a picture of what kind of things people do in this group and, and uh, like what the discussions might be about. But what else? Oh, also there's like ad hoc groups. So for example, we have uh, an inclusion ad hoc group to, to talk about inclusion and, and diversity within the committee. It's a problem that we care about and uh, well, let's be honest, it is a, a problem that we have uh, so it, it's something that we focus on and sort of work on uh, as we go. But then you, you might be wondering, or you might already have an idea, but who is DC that like who is the the group of people who are part of this, right? Who are who are doing all of these things or sort of holding all these discussions? So it includes people who are called delegates, who are delegates from different member organizations. As I mentioned in like the first or second slide, I'm one of the delegates. So uh, this includes people uh, who we call in, in our own lingo, implementers, right? And from that we mean people who see this beautiful specification of JavaScript and say, how can I implement this? How can I put this in the real world? Because let's be honest, at the end of the day, uh, for better or for worse, JavaScript is just a bunch of words written by a bunch of nerds like us. So it, it needs to exist in the real world. But JavaScript in itself does not exist in the real world. What does exist is browsers that implement this, or like more specifically engines that can run this whatever, <laughs> this regime that, that is far from reality. So there's people from Google, for example, working on Chrome and V8. There's people from Apple, from Mozilla, and different uh, organizations like Brave and so on who work on implementing this programming language that we use. Then there's large websites who have a very uh, strong interest in the future, the evolution, and the, the sort of uh, feature set, if you will, of the language. This includes players like Bloomberg, which is pretty much like the, the biggest, richest, uh, most vital for business organization. They, they run a huge business that is uh, for which the web in general and in JavaScript specifically is very vital. There is PayPal, for example, and many more. Salesforce, like any huge website that relies on the web would have a vested interest in what's happening with JavaScript, right? Then there's academics. They have a vested interest in the programming language also to, to study, to, to teach it to other academics, and also for their academic projects, for their research, for theoretical reasons. They might want JavaScript to be a, a, a safe language, right? They, they might want JavaScript to be a mathematically sound language. It's not sound in any way. It's completely unsound. The language doesn't make sense in most ways, but 
so they, they would like the language to make more sense, to be less leaky, to be less chaotic. And, and so they have a vested interest in the evolution as well. Then there is entities like the OpenJS Foundation. Uh, how many of you have heard of them? Huh? Right? Not, not many. But OpenJS Foundation, you, know of many, you might know of many prominent open source projects in the JavaScript ecosystem, like Node is a big one. There's jQuery. It's still alive and kicking. Well, there, there's a number of like corporate open source projects, but all the independent, uh, not sort of supported directly by by a, a organization, open source projects like Babel, uh, all of these have a vested interest in the language as well, because I mean that's the language that they're all about. So OpenJS Foundation is an entity that that sort of represents the interest of all of these groups. So there's people from Node, for example, who are very invested in language, who are participating through the OpenJS Foundation. Then there's people who we call invited experts. These are people who are subject matter experts, maybe in some area or another. These can be experts in language evaluation. These can be experts in security, in, in uh, internationalization, and so on. So all of these subject matter experts are invited to the, com uh, to the committee as experts. And they, they try to help us with some of our work. That's weird. Uh, then there is community representatives, right? Like there are a lot of people who write JavaScript all over the world. A lot of developers who might have uh, you know, no connection to anybody in the committee, but have still a vested stake in, in the language. I mean, you all, all of you write JavaScript, right? I hope. I mean, it's CityJS. Uh, so, I may, I'm making an assumption here, but uh, all of you, member or delegate or not, working on a browser or not, still care about the language, still have opinions, and that's good. Uh, it's important to have good opinions about the language. So these uh, developer communities need to be represented somehow. So there's a number of people in the committee who are representatives from different communities uh, or open source projects, as I said. And then there's contributors. These are people who are not directly involved in the day-to-day -day functioning of all of the uh, committee, but are still vital to, to the work, actually. So it's like there's meetings where they might not be present, but they're still a vital force in driving proposals, driving features, doing research and like user research. So all of these things uh, sort of comprises the set of people who work on JavaScript in different ways. And then there is the community at large, uh, to the, the representatives, but also in general. I mean, if you're anybody who has ever been on GitHub on any project, just like ranting about the lack of a very specific feature, or, or like yelling at people for why, I don't know, point 0.1 plus point 0.2 is not point 0.3, it's, you're part of the community, and your feedback it is directly or indirectly drives the future of the language. So view that uh, responsibly. Uh, but yeah, like most of the presentation would be about how to be this last member. Uh, but yeah, let's get into that later, is what I mean. But where, right? Uh, where does all of this happen, uh, all of our work? Well, I had photos here, which, I mean, yeah, they're not working. But uh, these were screenshots, so it's like low effort anyway. Uh, I can just say that there's GitHub organization. There's a GitHub organization at github.com slash tc39. And that is where the bulk of our work is. I mean, don't let anybody tell you otherwise. There's meetings, there's uh, sort of internal groups and, and sort of people talking with each other about how to get stuff done. But at the end of the day, everything happens on GitHub. And that in, in like open repositories. So this means that you can and, and sort of sh should, uh, but asterisk, uh, be able to, uh, you know, be heard and, and have your opinions and, and sort of create a repository and say, hey, I have an idea. This is amazing. So everything is on GitHub. Everything is under a single organization. A all of the work we do, ongoing and otherwise. Uh, there is one main repository, so to say. It's ECMA 262, no surprise, like that's the name of the spec. And that is where the ECMA 262 spec is. That is the spec that includes all of the programming language in words. It's kind of weird and huge. 
and I had screenshots, so I mean, not very original, but it kind of got the point across. The point is that at github.com slash pc39 slash fma262, you can read the entire language spec, but not only that, you have access to issues and pull requests, and, and you can file your own issues. So, so you can get involved. There's also slash ECMA402, so that's sort of the equivalent, and so on. Like All these repositories make up the bulk of the JavaScript language. Everything is done in the open, and everything is open to feedback, roughly. <laughs> What do we do? Well, uh, what can you do, let's say? Well, there's everything uh, that is sort of a change in the language is essentially, at the end of the day, a pull request to the standard GitHub, GitHub repository. So any tiny changes that you want to do to the semantics and so on can be a pull request. These include meta changes. Meta changes are changes that don't actually change anything at all. Uh, except some meta things, like maybe you improve the build pipeline, maybe you change the compiler, make things prettier, change the color of the spec. Uh, you can try. Uh, so th these are meta changes. Then there's markup changes or editorial changes. You can change how things are worded slightly. You can, you can make things easier to read, easier to understand. That doesn't change the behavior of the language at the end of the day, but it can improve the experience or it can uh, remove some sort of problems in the markup or sort of make it less terse, you know, like make it easier to read, easier to implement. Yeah, these are the editorial changes as I meant. Uh, at the end of the day, the editorial changes are, are subject to the discretion of the editor group. So as I mentioned in the beginning, I'm one of the editors of one of the specifications, but all of the specifications do have editors. And these editors not only are responsible for all the editorial changes, but they, they also get to have the last say on these editorial matters. So they cannot make single-handedly any changes in the language, but they are responsible for how clean things are, or like how things are laid out, or how difficult it is to write something down. So that, that's kind of their day-to-day -day job. They're, they're cleaning things up and, and making it easier for all of you and us. Then there are the fun stuff, the, the normative changes. These changes change well, uh, as the name suggests, the norm. They, they change the language in a fundamental way. So, so these cha changes would affect how the language works. Uh, and then any change that is too big to be considered just a tiny change and, and can be sort of discussed in, in a single <laughs> sitting uh, need to be a proposal. A proposal is more uh, complex. It, is, it has more nuance and just a tiny change that can be yes or no, right? So I'll get into that, like why proposals aren't just zero and one. But yeah, for each proposal, you have different groups of people. You have authors, people who are responsible for writing the text, people who are responsible for thinking out what, what goes in, what stays out, the design, right? Uh, this can be anyone, including anybody who's not on the committee. And then there are champions. Champions need to be people on the committee, uh, delegates, pretty much. So, so in case any of you who is not a, a member or, or like a, a delegate would make a proposal, you can totally be an author of a proposal and keep driving it and, and sort of be uh, sort of constantly thinking and obsessing and designing a feature, right, or, or many features. But you still would need a champion, a, somebody to. Uh, go in to the committee and say, hey, like this thing needs to be considered and sort of be your voice in that room. Kind of like uh, trial by combat and like they're, <laughs> they're fighting the rest of the people for you. Also, uh, as I said, like proposals are not zero and one. So there is a stage process. It's, it's a bit complex, but not that much. I'll, I'll explain in just a bit. And then there are reviewers, like people who are li uh, like explicitly responsible for reviewing any certain proposal. Now this could be, um, you know, like at the end of the day, everybody's reviewing everything. Like people are very conscious about what changes you're proposing to the language. But then there are always a explicit group of reviewers for each proposal who are responsible for making sure nothing is wrong. And the last ingredient, the, the most beautiful ingredient, uh, in all of this process is consensus. So I'll explain what that means and, and sort of what that implies in just a bit. 
when does all of this happen? Well, we have, okay, this is also slightly outdated. We have bi-monthly meetings, not quarterly anymore. It's just changed recently. Uh, they are four days, yes. They are four days uh, uh, and throughout the week. So that is one crazy week of, of a lot of work and a lot of deliberation. They are in person. Uh, well, after COVID, not all of them are in person, but uh, a lot of them are in person. At this point, we uh, it's not confirmed yet, so but it's going to be four in person, for example, next year. So a lot of them in person in, in interesting locations. So like the next one, actually next week or so, is going to be in Tokyo. Fun. I'm not going. So you see me here. Uh, that's what I said for this place. Uh, and then there's light meetings in between. These do not happen anymore, sorry, uh, because it's all subsumed by the six meetings instead. There is, however, a monthly ECMA 402 meeting. So the, the other group that I talked about, the, the people who are responsible for internationalization, well, they meet every month. And so it's sort of a different cadence, a different working style, but at the end of the day, people are meeting regularly. Okay. Is that, yeah, the what, okay, okay, just ran. Yeah, so uh, they meet and, and they discuss what to do, where to go, and like opinions, hot takes, all of these things, right? Fun stuff. There are then other smaller, more focused meetings. These could be as frequent as every week. So for example, a group of people working on, say, the pipeline operator can be meeting every week to, to uh, basically uh, comb through all the abuse they get on GitHub. Uh, <laughs> it's funny, not funny, okay. Uh, but, or like the, the group that designs Temporal. And so they meet almost every week or so at this point to just go through the last steps of that proposal. Again, more on that later. Uh, and then there are incubator calls. What are incubator calls? Well, uh, when we are working on something that is sort of unclear and, and uncharted, we incubate that. So we have incubator calls where we invite a bunch of people and, and discuss that one specific thing to sort of incubate that idea, to sort of, uh, uh, well, develop it, if you will, until it, it's ready to be discussed in the in the big room with all the people involved, right? And then there's GitHub. And, and I mean, okay, this, if you look at this slide, it looks like a tiny point at the end of a huge presentation, but it's it's the most important point. Let me stress on that. Everything at the end of the day happens on GitHub. Even if we decide on something, the change would come on GitHub. And like, yeah, we usually what the workflow looks like approximately is that somebody would make a pull request and then the final decision on if we should merge that or not, or like which direction to go into, would happen on a meeting maybe, but it is all on GitHub, right? Like you can influence everything through GitHub. You don't have to be in any of these meetings. And, and fun fact, like I, I know some people who have uh, contributed so much to the JavaScript programming language, uh, academics or just anti-social people uh, who do not exist out of GitHub. Like I, I, I would not, uh, if you told me they were a chatbot, I, I would believe you. Uh, so, but, but it's it's amazing, it's prolific how, how much work they've done within the language and how much they've influenced really the development of our favorite, I hope, uh, programming language without ever meeting anybody in person or even like on a video call. So, so that's how much you can do as long as you're driven and, and have like, I don't know, 48 hours a day. Uh, and then there's discourse. Now discourse is uh, a weird, fun thing. It's, it's unclear even to me after years what it is. It is kind of a mailing list meets a uh, forum. And uh, to be honest, I don't go there. But I mean, people do. And they are very passionate about JavaScript. So they fight or, or like agree with each other once a year or so uh, on this platform. But it is a fun platform to go and discuss things about JavaScript. How does any of this work out? Well, okay, so here's, this is where the consensus process comes in. And this is the most important point. Like if there's one thing that you take away, it is this. There's no voting involved. There's never any voting for any feature. That's because voting would lead to terrible results. Let me explain why. Uh, every decision that we make 
for JavaScript has to be consensus based. This means that everybody in the room has to agree upon everything at all times. We do not do anything that a single individual would disagree with. And that is very important for a language like JavaScript or the web in general, because the web is a standard. The web is something that everybody needs to work with together and collaborate. So anybody disagreeing with something would mean uh, sort of it, it would hamper the, the web in a way, right? The, the, the idea, the, the, <laughs> the romantic nature of the web implies that, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of an idea like that, right? Like it's something that everybody can build on top of and it's a common set of tools. So it needs consensus and this means a lot of discussion, this means a lot of deliberation, a lot of compromise at times, trade-offs, but at the end of the day, everything needs to be designed in a way where nobody opposes it. Nobody, uh, like not everybody needs to be enthusiastic for it, but nobody opposes it. That's important. And how is this done? Well, there is a diverse set of people in the committee, you could have imagined by the, the, the description of the stakeholders, there's people who are responsible for uh, the, the programming of the different uh, engines, and then there's people who are responsible for building huge websites. So like, you can imagine how the interest of a lot of these stakeholders might be in conflict with each other, and it kind of is, and that is kind of the point, really. Like it is, the, the important work of any standards organization like this is to work and satisfy, uh, satisfy everybody's needs and goals, and that's very difficult. That is kind of why we are, are so worked up all the time. But it is important for a programming language like JavaScript, something that is so widely used and so popular, to actually cater to everybody's needs and goals. Otherwise it fails, right? It, it becomes uh, specific and like sort of uh, targeted and not something that is uh, truly a general, a general purpose programming language that can be used by everyone to build anything they want, which is kind of the idea of JavaScript these days. There's obviously objections and concerns raised to everything and anything. Uh, if there's something somebody's talking about that sort of doesn't quite work, you can raise a concern, you can object to it. Uh, but the important component of that is that you require backing rationales. You cannot just be unreasonable. You cannot say, I do not like this feature because I do not, or I, I do not understand this, or uh, uh, you're not a nice person, so I, I do not support your feature. No, you need a backing rationale. You should tell somebody who you're opposing why you're opposing them, and like what they can do to mitigate that, right? Because and otherwise, there would be no way for us to collaborate. But the important part is that no stakeholder is above another. Uh, small or big, uh, rich or poor, all of our stakeholders in the process uh, have an equal footing. And that is very important for a language like JavaScript, and uh, which is constantly evolving. And, and you can imagine JavaScript as a language that was created in 1995, very different stakeholders back then from what we have right now. I mean, uh, back then maybe Netscape, like okay, Mozilla maybe existed back in the day, but like that was sort of the driving force behind the language. Maybe a few browsers would come in after that. But now, like JavaScript is, is a very different language, it's a very different space, and uh, all the stakeholders are equally important, and sort of uh, just like that. The important component of all of this friction, like I, I, I understand what you're all thinking, you're all judging us, and you're, uh, I keep saying all of these things, and you think friction, 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 like why all this red tape is wrong? It's important because when we're building a standard, when we're building something that is and this is important for the web, uh, it is never gonna break, it's always moving forwards, there's never gonna be any breakage going backwards. We should not standardize things that are not ready. It's better to not standardize things or not do things rather than doing things which are not ready or which are unbaked or things that somebody has an objection with, right? It's better to wait and do our research and do things well. So, we talked about the stage process. Are you interested in knowing a little bit more about the stage process before we move on? Uh, how much time do I have? I, can you, okay, uh, I don't know. 
I hope, a little bit. Okay, so quickly going through this, uh, stage zero is a straw person, like, uh, you know, a, a tiny diagram that you make on a, on a, uh, a tissue paper when you're at the restaurant, you get a crazy idea, you get a vision uh, while asleep and you try to cite it, uh, or something, like a, a basic, uh, okay, not a lot. So I'll, I'll quickly go through the stage process. Well, uh, you know, very basic things, stage zero, doesn't even need to be a real thing, just a haunch that you had, right? Uh, well, yeah, just what I said. Stage one is when we actually call it a proposal. It becomes serious. So now you're starting to think in real terms. But real terms doesn't mean that you're thinking in terms of solutions. Real terms means that you're thinking it in terms of a problem. So stage one requires a problem statement. Uh, and then you start describing a general shape of a solution. You, you can say, hey, like, we might do things this way or another, but it's mostly framed in terms of what are we missing or what are we lacking, right? So we identify potential blockers that might uh, sort of block us from doing something to begin with or solving a problem to begin with. It's very important to do it at an early stage so that we don't waste a lot of time thinking about things and then realize, oh, boom, very bad. And uh, yeah, stage two is a draft. This is when things get real. This is when we start describing in, in syntax and through semantic details how things are going to be played out. So things get serious. We, we start thinking about how this feature might look like in, in real terms. And then stage three is a candidate. It's basically a candidate feature, so it's it's a real feature that might or might not end up in the language, basically. So now we're sort of figuring out all the details, and and we say, hey, like we have done all the sort of weird thinking up and like all the armchair research that we could do so far. So now we need feedback from users, from implementations. We we now need to throw this feature out in the real world and see what people think about this, what browsers think about this. Is this even viable? Is this implementable in, in terms of memory? Is this going to make every browser like 10 times slower or something? These things need to be figured out as well, right, before we finish. And then stage four is when we finally say, OK, we, we did all of those things, and now it's finished. So then it is tested and like ready for addition to the standard. So testing is important for adding it to the standard, because like once you add something to the language, you need to make sure that everybody does it and in the correct way. So that's it. I, I have no time, so I, I'm going to skip through some things. But uh, we need to build consensus by uh, you know, sort of iterating with stakeholder input. So there's all of these stakeholders that are important for every feature. And we develop it that way. The Champions Act is a bridge between the authors and the committee. And then any aspects of any feature can be discussed. And we give feedback over the well, it's we, we raise concerns early and, and sort of asynchronously, OK? Uh, and, and that's pretty much it. Like, we, we try to work through the process like that. So consensus is very important, is, is an indicator of the current stage. You, at any point, you have no guarantees that any feature will reach uh, completion. And that is important, because we don't know yet. But either way, uh, we, we go through the process, and, and uh, that's how we end up, yeah, finishing a feature. Yeah, I, I'm not going to go with that. Uh, that was it, but uh, I had a lot, actually, yeah. How do you get, no, <laughs> how do you get involved? Well, I, as I said, go on the issue tracker. MDN is very important for everybody who writes JavaScript, so help us write that. Uh, any ad addition to the documentation is very important. Discourse if you like fighting on a forum, uh, and you can always join the committee as a member. That was all my time. Uh, if you have any doubts, I'm around, and, and you can find me on the internet. But thank you all for being an amazing audience. <laughs>
cannot stop it. Yeah. Fine. Okay, so thank you everyone. Uh, and let's welcome Park on stage to talk about. Well, okay, we yes, have I'll, I'll have more things. But yes, so huge round of applause for Park. Slides. How can I send you a detail? Send you a 